Xin chào các bạn. Welcome to the seventh episode of Kaleidoscope Viet. The show is hosted by Friends of Vietnam Heritage, FVH for short, the leading culture and heritage society based in Hanoi for more than 20 years. In each episode of Kaleidoscope Viet, we explore the colorful personality of Hanoi and Vietnam, diving into this nation's rich and vast culture, heritage and tradition. Art plays a vital role in our life. It connects people so in an incredible way, regardless of geographical distances. There's an American woman who was attracted by Vietnamese art and became a bridge between our small country and the world. Suzanne Lich is the art director of Art Vietnam Gallery and a leading authority on contemporary art in Vietnam. And for this episode, I had a chance to talk with her about Vietnamese art and art in general. Suzanne also shared her vision about the future art gallery in the multimedia world. Uh, but they are also top calligraphers, so they're taking an ancient art form and making it modern. So I would suppose, I'm just thinking about this now, I've become kind of like a bridge from the old times, from the really older way of thinking and an artist working to a new time. And I have to say quite Kaleidoscopia. But as usual, let's enjoy some music. Today we will go back in time with the Vietnamese Kachu music. This is a Vietnamese genre of musical storytelling originated from the northern of Vietnam. The song called Hong Hong Tuyết Tuyết is written by Dr. Dương Khuê in the mid-18th century. The surface meaning is about the scandalous relationship between a young singer and an old man. However, there is an underlying meaning where it shows the important feeling of a government official who was serving under the Đức. His 15 years of service was in vain as the contemporary authority has surrendered from the French. Đâu 
hồng hồng tuyệt tuyệt mỗi ngày nào còn chưa biết cãi chi The question that everyone wants to ask is, why Vietnam? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe why so long? Uh, why Vietnam is very easy to answer, actually, because um, I I was living in Tokyo. This is 1993, and my husband had just died in 1992, quite suddenly, after 10 years of living there, and. I, um, everything by 1993, kind of the end of the golden decade of Japan, the economy mm -hmm. um, was uh, really declining. So, and my visa and permission to stay and my housing contract, everything was going to expire in December of 93. So in early 93, I started thinking very seriously about you know, what am I going to do with my life? I was about 44 years old at the time and just widowed. And I thought, oh, I'm too young to be a widow. And I hadn't worked for 10 years mm -hmm. while we had lived in Japan. I'm an interior designer by education. And uh, that's what I did in New York. So I was quite, I mean, I was concerned, but I was also wanting to find some big passion to build my life around. So I went to many places. I went to Beijing, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Chiang Mai, Shanghai, uh, just looking for some big passion to build my life around. And nothing was really happening. And then in October of 93, a friend of mine who is a producer for CBS News in Tokyo at the time, mm -hmm. she had been invited to be on Cafe Pacific's um, inaugural flight from Hong Kong to Saigon to report on Vietnam and Vietnam just opening up. So she came to see me to have tea and she brought with her um, a magazine and called the Vietnam Investment Review. Mm -hmm. And in that uh, magazine, there was an article that was written by Nora Taylor, who was at that time uh, studying at Cornell University in, in New York studying Southeast Asian art for her PhD. And she was living in Hanoi doing her research. And she wrote an article on a group of painters from Hanoi uh, called The Gang of Five. This article was called, it was written in August of 1993 in the Vietnam Investment Review. And it's called Arts Gang of Five. The ones to watch hold a third joint exhibition of art from the heart. And so I read the article and, you know, it's talking about how these artists, they were all born in like 1960 to 1962. So they got out of art school in 19, in the 80s, early 80s. So they were really the first generation of artists to paint in a time of peace in hundreds of years. Mm. So, you know, myself being an American and a Vietnam War generation, I was so moved by their story of how, you know, they were just children during the war and finally they're out of school 
country's very poor. Uh, the government's no longer requiring artists to do propaganda work. You know, the war's over. They're just mm -hmm. trying to rebuild the country. So these artists were really free to paint what they wanted. And it was really the first, as I got to understand, it was the first generation of artists that could dare to dream of mm -hmm. a better life and a better world. So they started painting. In the article, it had photographs of their works. And it was about, you know, their spiritual life, their everyday life, with objects from their life. Um, but the style of the work, which I, I studied art when I was in school, um, the style of their work was this really interesting fusion of Asian and Western art, you know, so they had the, all the training from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts that was started in Hanoi in 1925. So they have that base as their understanding and how they depict art. But then, of course, because they're Asian, they have that overlay of that way of thinking and styling. So for me, the works were so interesting and so beautiful and really so, especially being American again, as I said, you know, at that time, Americans only thought of Vietnam. And sadly, often many people, even today still, in the context of this terrible war, Vietnam War, where people suffered so much here. And uh, so to see this kind of signs of life and joy and just depiction of life, I was so moved and I thought, wow, who could imagine that this kind of artwork is coming out of this country? Yeah. You know, that we all envisioned as just devastated. So I was so moved and so impressed. And also, I think on another deeper, richer plane, um, I thought about myself, you know, being 45, and I have very, very kind parents and loving, and, and they really taught me how to, you know, they just wanted me to be happy and to pursue my dreams. And, but that also one should do something purposeful in, in your life to make the world a better place, mm -hmm. you know, add something by your presence. So that had always been kind of an overlaying um, motivation for my life. So I thought, wow, you know, I can come to this country that's, you know, completely devastated by war uh, and I can work with these artists and I could make a bridge of reconciliation um, through the power of art and mm. through the power, the beauty of the spirit, mm. which you know knows no boundary or race or color or religion, mm. and and to really show how we can heal our wounds, you know, from the war because everybody suffered, you know, and everybody no matter what country or you're from, everybody wants the same thing. You know, you want school and health and for your children, you want a happy life, you want to do meaningful work. So I thought, wow, I could, I could potentially, you know, make this bridge between the two countries and become like a small drop of water in the ocean of reconciliation between Vietnam and America. So I just immediately picked up the phone and I called this moving company in Tokyo that had moved me two or three times. <laughs> and I said, oh, Mr. Yamashita, you know, pack me up. I'm moving to Hanoi. About your work, so uh, could you tell me more, more details about like what exactly what did you do to become a bridge? So completely by chance, you know, I did, I left. January uh, 2000, I mean 1994, to come to Hanoi and completely by chance I met one of the Gang of Five on oh, my very first day. So that was a wonderful, you know, in the West we would say that's a wonderful serendipity. Yeah. But of course, as you or people in the East would say, oh, that's nonsense, you know, that was your destiny. And so now you're here, you know, so get to work.
Of course, I arrived, I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't know anything about Vietnam. I didn't know anything about the culture, these artists. So they were so kind to me. Uh, Tham Quan Vin, one of the Gang of Five, I met, is the artist I met on my first day. And on the very first day, he invited, I took, went to his house for lunch. And also, um, then after lunch, we went to the studio of Hatri Hu, another one of the Gang of Five. Yeah. And so I started to, you know, learn about their life. And, you know, at that time, Vietnam was still really relatively closed. And so I had to leave the country every month and a half. So I would, every time I would go out, I would bring uh, art books, art supplies, paper, anything. And so I kind of became their window to that outside world. And they became my window to Vietnam. Mm. So every day somebody, some artist, and especially this uh, young Viet Q, who I had met in the Ho Chi Minh mausoleum, who took me to Vin's house the first day, he was my translator, so I could understand. And um, every day we would go somewhere to some artist studio or a pagoda or a Cheo performance or, you know, just any, anything. Learning for me to learn about the culture and, and also for them to share their history and their lives with me. So that was really the beginning of my art education. Yeah. And then also, because I was a foreigner here, there weren't many foreigners living here at that time, um, a lot of business people and people from different embassies or something, when they would come to Hanoi, you know, they would hear about, oh, there's this American lady who works a lot with the artists in Vietnam, and if you call her, you know, you can meet them. So that way I started taking people to artist studios and and that's really how I started my life, uh, working with artists. And then I did my very first exhibition because of um, Hong Kong land is a very big uh, property developer in Hong Kong. It was based in Hong Kong about 150 years ago. Uh, and uh, they had just come to Vietnam and we're developing the first, building the first office tower on Hai Ba Chung Street. So the CEO of Hong Kong Land uh, was going back and forth and he was very interested in art. So he's the one that suggested, after I took him to many artist studios, this was in 97, just before the handover to China. Uh, he said, you know, Suzanne, let's do an exhibition of Vietnamese art in Hong Kong. Um, so he really helped me. He was my first big supporter. So I took five artists from Vietnam to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. for the, And it was called The Changing Face of Hanoi. Um, because it was exactly that. You know, the physical face of Hanoi was changing so much. You know, with these office towers and Western investment and hotels being built. And it, it was really a exciting time here in Vietnam for everyone. So that was the beginning. The Gang of Five, Bè Lũ Nam Tên, is a group of Hanoi painters who rose to prominence in the early 1990s in Vietnam. The group composed of five members, Hong Việt Dũng, Hà Chí Hiếu, Đặng Xuân Hòa, Trần Lương, and Phạm Quang Vinh. This is the first group of artists who gained international acclaim in post Đổi Mới Vietnam after 1986. The bold works conceptually depicted personal emotion 
as well as exploring different forms of artistic expression, which departed from the social realist tradition in Vietnamese art prevalent until the mid 1980s. So I guess at that point you are working with、uh, those people who you considered as the new generation of artists. But、um, how do you think about these current generation of artists? Do you work with them at all? Because like、um, because personally I know that there is a lot of digital things involved with art nowadays and.、Um, Well, a lot of like what we consider as new is, I guess, it's much different from back then. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the art, the art development in Vietnam has really progressed.、Mm-hmm. Um, I still, I mean, I still work with the, most of the artists that I worked with, you know, for twenty five years now. I still work with them. I do take on new artists, so we have a couple new artists now、um, that just graduated from this university that we work with. But I guess my work in general is still working with a lot of the artists that I've worked with for at least ten years, and they're mainly painters or sculptors or calligraphers, like the current show we have up now. Our scholars, Buddhist scholars, they're also known scholars,、uh, but they are also top calligraphers. So they're taking an ancient art form and making it modern. So I would suppose I'm just thinking about this now. I've become kind of like a bridge from the old times, from the really older way of thinking and an artist working to a new time. And I have to say, quite frankly, I'm、um, you know because I'm 74 years old now, and I'm not so used to all the computer technology and all the ways of you know really is changing so fast.、Uh, the way artists work now,、mm-hmm. so much digital work and multimedia work, and、um, I really like it, a lot of. Performance, a lot of、um, conceptual work.、Mm. That's very, very different from when I first came here. So I don't work with it so much. I certainly support it and think it's wonderful. I think there'll always be a place for the kind of art that I'm more familiar with. But that said,、um, I really enjoy working with a lot of these young. Curators and young students, art students、mm-hmm. and young artists, because you know they're presenting a fresh way to look at the world, and you know there needs to be people. I hope that my staff will take over this gallery and and you know continue it in their own, in the new way, the way that the art is developing. You know, because it's always changing. Society and art is it's it's living, so it's always changing and morphing into some. Different way,、yeah. but I think just like the past is always a part of the present. So, the past ways of working with art are still exist today. They just exist in that way, and then also in new forms. So,、mm-hmm. it's just kind of a continuum. Like, is there any、uh, features that you, when you look at an artwork, and you know that? Is from a Vietnamese artist because I guess nowadays we are for our young generation artist we are have the the pressures of how to present our culture in art and、um, a lot of、uh, artwork from young artists are usually be critiqued as like、uh, they have a lot of influence from the、uh, Japanese culture or. Oh, this is like too Western. It's not. It's not say Vietnamese in it. So, for you, what make you know that it is a Vietnamese art? <laughs> It's a really tough, good question.、Um, I can't say that I always know by any means. You know, of course, I can. Rec- the artists that I know, of course, 
But I think nowadays, because art is living just like we humans are living, so of course it's evolving. And because we are no longer, any nation is not a separate little nation anymore. We're all connected to the world at large. It's a global art creation network now. So I think it would be very challenging for anybody to look at some just if you just had a room full of art from all countries in the world. If you could tell which country each mm -hmm. artwork came from would be nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, of course, there are always some works that, that artists deal with specific issues that are maybe particular to their country that we would all recognize by either form or subject matter or that kind of thing. But I think the beauty of art, or any art form, is that it, it changes and morphs as life does. So it's not so, I think if you would ask any Vietnamese artist right now, you know, they don't want to be branded as a Vietnamese artist. They're an artist. Mm -hmm. They just express what they feel. And it's just because they happen to come from Vietnam. But just like I said before, you know, we are a composite of our past. So they can't help but have some elements that are very Vietnamese in their art, even if you can't recognize it, or maybe even when they don't recognize it. But maybe somebody from the outside would say, oh, you know, I've seen a lot of Vietnamese artists treat a subject in this way. Or, I mean, certainly artists that use a lot of Vietnamese motifs or, you know, then of course you, you can know or do something about their country. But in general, I mean, like if you saw an abstract work of art from Vietnam, how in the world would you know it came from Vietnam? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's difficult. Yeah, I guess for our generation, we are grow up in like a multimedia world and we are more exposed to the world. So I guess our like character put in the art might be a lot different from the older generation back then, right? Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I think the older generation, and even me, I'm that older generation now, um, <laughs> you know, they're trained class, especially the masters of, of Vietnam, you know, from the École des Beaux-Arts period from 1925. Those artists, you know, they have classic influence, of course, from all the European and also from the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union supported Vietnam. So you have that rich heritage from Central Asia and then also from Europe. So, and then from the US, from New York, you know, in the 20s and 30s. So you get this influence for sure but nothing like today when you know artists everybody gets on the internet and you can see your places you've never heard of and see how people live and so there's a lot of very rich inspiration that's really exciting i think it's a big global world now i mean that presents many challenges also and a lot of difficulties Hi, I'm Stella, the Vice Chair of Friends of Vietnam Heritage, or FBH for short. For those of you who are not familiar with what we do, we were founded in 1999, over 20 years ago, and since day one, we've been telling the story of Vietnam's culture and heritage to anyone and everyone who loves this country. As far as we know, FBH, based in Hanoi, is unique in Vietnam. We are the only organisation to bring all cultural activities together under one roof. So how do we do this? We run many activities, including around 25 Hanoi city walks in English, Japanese and Spanish, exploring the city through the eyes of the locals, wandering down hidden alleys and revealing the stories behind the buildings. Leading academics and professors share their knowledge in small group discussions, giving us a chance to dig down deep into a topic. Our excursions go off the beaten track, 
as we discover artisans and villagers eager to tell their stories, while our book club reviews Vietnamese literature and authors. These highlight just a few of our many, many activities. And if you would like to find out more about us, please email us at hello at fbheritage.org and our website is www.fbheritage.org. Kaleidoscopia. So, what do you think about it? Like, um, what is a good art, and um, like, what make it more valuable than just play like, just commercial one? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, difficult but interesting question. That is even as long as I work with artists and. I've loved art since I was very small. Um, that to me is the eternal life mystery. Like, okay, who who is really the ultimate judge of what's a good work of art? You know, of course we have people that are trained in art and art critics and art curators and you study art, you learn about art and and you can know what's really good technique and use of materials and what's really innovative and maybe hasn't been done before because you've seen a lot of work. But, you know, what has value in the art world is very arbitrary. And sometimes you have artists that are just magnificent marketing people. <laughs> <laughs> or they have people who want to market their work and they become, you know, incredibly famous and their work becomes very expensive. And then you can have some artists that nobody ever recognizes who could be just as good, maybe even better, but they haven't, they just don't have those opportunities. So it's so, I, I always find it very frustrating actually, because sometimes when I, work with an artist especially here in Vietnam because it's only now in the last 10 years that a lot of Vietnamese artists are really getting exposed around the world and going to important you know biennales and important exhibitions um, so there the world is really just beginning to know what kind of treasures so to speak come out of Vietnam but I think that yeah, I guess it's like anything in life. It's very, it's difficult and arbitrary. Mm. You know, who decides what's really great? I mean, there's a lot of artists that are very famous right now that I would never have in my home. I don't want to live with it. I don't particularly like it, but somebody does and somebody thinks it's really great. And so, so that's okay. You know, we all, we all can't like the same thing. So, uh, in your point of view, what uh, is your favorite art? I mean, for personally, for me, is I prefer those with a realistic picture, with a lot of beautiful lighting and like that. But uh, for you, what struck you as is the most incredible art? Wow, that's a <laughs> that's a big question, yeah, and I think it's a big wonderful big question. question. Actually, I mean, it's fun to think about. But I guess I'd have to say, for me, art that I really love, that I feel passionate about, is a work of art that I'm not so attracted to. Just art that's pretty and. You know, it's like a lovely landscape or something like that. I can appreciate it for sure, but I am really attracted to art that makes me feel really intensely about something. I mean, it could be like incredible joy, like I can't believe that, that I see something that just looks spiritual almost, that I, I go into another realm of thinking or something that makes me feel very sad. Mm. That, I, I guess if I was really truthful. I like paintings where I feel the richness of, the importance of sorrow in life mm. and how that plays such a big role in 
how we develop as human beings, and how we have empathy for people. And um, so I guess I would be attracted to works that really make me feel intensely that way. I can remember a long time ago, I was at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, you know, which is a, one of the world's amazing museums. And I saw this painting, a painter, I, I don't even remember now who it was, European painter, I think. But it was just a portrait of a man, a really old, old, old man. And his face was so, you could see every little wrinkle and it was so powerful. And then the title of the painting was, Time, Thou Hast Left Me Old. And, you know, that was so, it was so beautiful, you know, because, yeah, we get old. <laughs> and he was really old. And it was just a beautiful feeling, you know, to see that, that somebody wanted to express that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like art like that. I guess for an artist, it's when we create art, maybe people don't really aware that they are making, they're creating those emotions, right? But like, uh, it's funny because um, if, uh, when others see their art, they might uh, have different emotions than the artist himself, right? Certainly. Most certainly. I mean, most always. That's usually the case. <laughs> and that's why so many artists, I mean, they're getting more used to it now knowing that they have to be able to talk about their artwork because that the world international world seems to require that but i remember when i first came here and i would ask artists you know can you can you tell me a little bit about about this work like what where did your feeling come from and why did you do this that way or something and so many would say I don't know and you know I just did it and you know it's your job to figure out <laughs> what does it say to you and I think I think most artists feel that way it's like they they just express what they feel inside and, and some some may really I mean a lot of artists especially now the young artists that I see in Vietnam I'm amazed at the kind of research that they do. I mean, they might have an idea about something, and of course, because of Google and everything, they do a huge amount of research. And then they have all this, it can be from poetry, literature, science, anything. And that has some kind of effect on, on how they express what they're thinking about. But they can't, they're not going to be able to verbalize all that, you know, as to, well, I, I got the inspiration for this from an old ruin in Chile or something. And this, you know, they, they won't be able to say that. And a lot of it is subconscious, you know, like we do a lot of things because of our past or something that somebody just said to us. It touches something in us and then we express something. So I think... For all artists, it's really, really difficult to express well in words what you're saying with your artwork. It's kind of another art form, actually. And there are, I think, in contemporary art schools today, they have classes in that where they actually teach artists, okay, it's great, you know, you have to be the best, you can't depend on having a gallery or a dealer or an agent or a patron or who's going to support you and talk about your work you need to be able to talk about your work and you need to be able to know how to present it in the best way like frame it and present it to people you have to be able to do all of that so it's a lot i think a lot of artists just don't it's like Leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to make art. And you figure it out. And that's fair too. You know, so I think it it runs the whole gamut. But I think it's it's hard, you know, it's hard for artists to talk about their art. They have to make it and they let you figure the viewer has to figure it out. And also, you know, every viewer, this is why I love especially I love to have children come in because 
especially if they're five to seven or something like that. They're not so affected yet by teachers and people telling them, oh, you, no, that's not right. You know, you, this is what this means. You know, they're very free. So I love to hear what they see. You know, they see things that it's like, wow, I never saw that in that work. It's so interesting. So we all see something different, mm -hmm. you know, according to our own personal history, life histories. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the magic of looking at art, mm -hmm. appreciating art. Yeah, maybe even the artist sees the painting different than the critic, right? Absolutely. Or, you know, I've, I've had art taken a child to an artist's studio and they've said something and the artist was like, oh, wow. I never thought about that. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I'd had that idea. But it's in there. It's in the work, you know, because the child saw it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean when I say all of us in life, you know, we do things that come from our subconscious. Uh, and we're, we're maybe not aware of it, but others can see it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of wonderful. The stone of style is also an abstract way right? because some artists are not even aware that they are making a style yeah i think i think it can happen that way for sure they get something something feels good you know just like you, we all gravitate towards things that suit us or a lifestyle or a music style or a clothing style or a writing style or painting you know you do something that kind of feels good and you keep doing it so i i think that yeah sometimes i was like anything in life when you i always feel this is just my thinking but when you get too comfortable with the way you live or work or exist you need to mix it up a little bit mm -hmm. you need a little bit of change because you can just get out of, you become automatic. You're not really fully conscious of what you're doing every, you know, if like you say a blessing before a meal or something, and if you say the same thing every time, you just start to say it by rote, like a robot. You're not Actually thinking it, it and feeling it. So you need to kind of mix it up, you know, to, to, you need people need change. You know, you get stuck. Mm. And change is hard. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn new technology and how to use my new phone and my new computer, and it drives me crazy. But you know, it feels so good when I finally make a little progress. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, I just remember uh, one of my favorite author had mentioned that uh, the idea of uh, genre is sometimes is uh, just a way for people to find, like, to find what they want to find in the bookstore. However, like, um, sometimes you can come to the book that like it's not in any kind of genre and you suddenly discovered like a new world from those accidents and yeah absolutely i agree like i've gone into a bookstore looking for something specific i'm just trying trying to think now of the there's an indian writer that i love his name is naipaul he's quite well known and I don't even remember now the title of the book, but I was going in to get something specific and then I saw one of his books and it, the title was so amazing. That's why I thought, oh, I have to buy that book. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just because the title was so evocative, it was so beautiful. And, and it was, it was a beautiful book. I can't remember the title. Okay. Naming is also in form of art, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I guess for, for those, even in, in like a traditional artwork where the people paint and they have to name their artwork, they have to come with something yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's a, that's most definitely, it's an art form that, that becomes a, an art in itself. Because just like that, that book, you know, I don't, I don't, I'd heard of Nightfall, but I don't think I'd read any of his books at that point. 
and the title alone is what and then of course he became one of my favorite writers so um, that was just from the title the word the power of words like the power of an image you have exposed to a lot of art in vietnam so do you have like um, your favorite paintings or favorite artwork and why, why did it make you so interested in it? Wow, I mean, I have so many favorites, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, of course, my first artworks that I saw in Vietnam were by the Gang of Five. That really touched me. And, um, and I suppose their works just like I said before, were because they touched upon, you know, their really intimate feelings, feelings about their spirituality and about sadness. And like one, I think probably one of the very first paintings I bought was from Hatri Hugh. And it's just the big kind of semi-abstract face of a Buddha and then a woman is standing at the side, looking to the side, and she's wait, like waiting for someone, waiting for a loved one to come back from the war. And that's one of my favorite. I love that painting because it's so, I mean, it's universal. And then, of course, um, yeah, all of the Sam Quan Vin, who made so many wonderful works, and all of the Gang Five have done wonderful, wonderful works. And then younger, as I started to work with an artist like Le Quoc Viet, who's a Buddhist scholar and a known scholar, and he does beautiful calligraphy. His work is very powerful. And his teacher, Feng Kam Tung, who does kind of a lot of work on classic, iconic stories from Vietnam and Buddhism. Uh, and then there's conceptual work that the young artists do today that I really love. So I, I really can appreciate a, a really wide range of work. I think it's hard to, you know, say I have favorites because I mean, of course, some touch me more than others. Uh, but it's always evolving and always, always changing. And I'm always seeing something that I really love. So that's, uh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Kaleidoscope view. Uh, we've talked about the future of art. Um, what is your vision of like future gallery in terms of Vietnamese artwork? I mean, like um, the integration of sounds, of lighting, and also traditional artwork. What is your vision of that? Well, I think that it's just like the world, everything. That is so, it's always moving and transitioning and morphing into something. I mean, I think you know, now after the COVID pandemic and people couldn't travel and people couldn't go to galleries. So, so many, everything moved online and artists got used to, you know, posting things and making 3D imagery so you can actually tour their studio and see their works. And I mean, the world has become so accessible and the ways of presenting art are really changing. You know, I think there'll always be a place for traditional galleries, you know, because some people just feel more, they want to see the work and talk to the gallerists and talk to the artists. So you'll always have that. But then there'll be online, a lot of online and 3D touring of spaces. And, and you can also, of course, like nowadays, which is so wonderful, and I, I listen to them a lot. There's so many lectures on art of people that go all over the world and talk to artists and go to museums it's such a rich you can get just exposed to so many ways of looking at art and appreciating art and that's um, that's a wonderful thing 
you know, and like you said, the sound, light, music, smoke, I mean, everything becomes like theater, really. Mm -hmm. It's like art has become theater. I can remember, oh, it's probably 2015 or something. I walked in, I was at the Venice Biennale, which is considered, you know, the top and oldest art, big international art exhibition in the world. And it's, I mean, Venice is so beautiful. It's a work of art in itself. It's so beautiful there. And I walked into this pavilion and I think it was um, somewhere in India, the artist. And it was, um, the artists were actually filming the viewer and just seeing how the viewer reacted. Like, I, <laughs> it was so strange. I think it was a show called My East is Your West. And they wanted to, I mean, I remember walking in and there were these three, there was this video as I think, or maybe they were the actual people, artists sitting there but really still. So you didn't know if they were like mock-ups or if they were real or was it? And then they just waited to see what you would do. So I can remember, I think. They kind of moved and, hello? And, and, and nobody would react. And so then they, I don't know what they did with that, whatever they were filming, I guess. I don't know, it was all so totally bizarre for me. And I thought, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. That's like making the viewer become the artist. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah, art can be anything. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's really, really exciting and uh, interesting to see. I mean, sometimes I think about artists and and in Vietnam too, of course, I think, I see something that an artist does and I think, wow, how did they, like, where did that idea come, like, how did that start? How did you, how did you have that idea? I mean, it's so crazy and wonderful and it's, I'm always, I'm always interested. I always think, where does it start? Like, how does an artist start a work of art? Mm. But to me, it's like the eternal big question. <laughs> I guess the artists also ask themselves that question. <gasps> so, yeah, they just do it, right? They just do it. Yeah, yeah the, the idea just came to them and they, they just, just start. Yeah. I think because a lot of, I studied art and made art when I was in university. And then when I got out, I started working as an interior designer. And then when I came here, of course, my whole life is just working with artists. So I've had many artists that say, especially when I ask them things like that, they say, Suzanne, why don't you just, you know, get a piece of paper and why don't you do, make something? And I find that I am like paralyzed. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. I can't even draw anymore. I used to be able to draft and do three dimensional drawing, interior drawings and things like that. And I think it's somehow because I see such amazing artwork from all over the world. It's like, I, how do I, how would I start? I don't know what to start with. And I think most artists all tell me that you just start, start with anything, doesn't matter. Make, just make a big red slash. Okay, start. And I think that's how it happens. They just start. You've got to have the courage to just jump in the river. I guess, uh, yeah, it's funny because um, when you talk about start, I guess some artists have the terms as art block, right? So yeah. I think the sense is they're afraid to start. They're afraid that what they do is not valuable enough. But I guess most incredible art come from the courage of trying to start the first line. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of courage. I mean, like anything. I like to write. I think that's more my art form, I suppose, if you could say that. And for me, it's really hard. I mean, I have to have like a deadline and like the pressure has to build. I keep thinking about what I want to say. And then I have to have a deadline. Otherwise, I don't start. And then I just start. And then I really get into it and I really enjoy it. And then I make it better, hopefully, I make it better and better. And I think that's exactly what 
Yeah, all creative people do. It's just, yes. you have to just start. You have to start. <laughs> you have to yes. have the courage to start. Yeah. They may not always be successful. And I think that's what I really admire about artists who, you know, become very successful and very famous with a certain style of art. And then they do something completely different. And sometimes it's not very successful. Yeah. Maybe people perceive it as, oh my God, what is that? Well, that's courage. That's really trying to get out of the box. And that takes courage. And that is the end of today's show. We hope you enjoy our episode about the art world. We will come back in the future with other aspects of Vietnamese culture. Tạm biệt và hẹn gặp lại các bạn.